<laughs> Sorry about that. That's fine. I wanted to change my background. <laughs> I'll just leave it alone for now. <laughs> anyway. Absolutely fine. Um, so is it is the audio okay? Do I does this audio make sound fine. okay? Perfect. Okay. Sounds great. All right. Cool. All right. So Well again, delighted to be here, man. So <laughs> thank you. Right, okay. Cheers. So I get a I'll uh I'll just I'll just do a clap because I'll let edit out and then I know where we started and it's just easier for uh, yep. the, the editor. So, <clears throat> welcome back to the Career Dad Show, and I'm joined today by Chris Bishop. Chris, how are you? I'm well, thank you. Awesome. Delighted I, to be here. No, I'm so so pleased to have you here. And we've spoken um, a little bit just before we started recording. We spoke a little bit last week, and there are so many fascinating topics <laughs> to cover, and we will try and get through them all. But you know, when we spoke a few weeks ago, we had a fascinating conversation. Um, around the future of work and the future of jobs. And I, I definitely want to talk about that because I think it's so, so important. But before we do, I'd just love to know a little bit more about your own journey. Because am I right in thinking that you've had seven or eight careers? Um, yes, I have. I describe myself as a nonlinear multimodal careerist. Okay. Um, and I, I say I've had eight careers so far. And by that, I mean I've done things that um, friends or colleagues are still doing for a living, but yeah. then I've moved into sort of other kinds of roles. So that's kind of what I describe as a, a career, if you will. Yeah, because um, I think it's sorry, sorry to interrupt, because I think it could be no, no. easy just for people listening. Like, we're not talking about seven or eight jobs. We're talking about actual, completely different fields of careers, right? Yeah, I mean, so I, I see if I can keep this brief. I tend to be long winded, but. <laughs> Um, first of all, I have a degree in German literature from a small liberal arts school in Vermont. Um, right, I currently live in Connecticut, just to orient your listeners. Um, right after graduating, I got a gig touring with a band called McHenry Spring. Uh, we opened for acts like the Eagles and ZZ Top. Um, when the band broke up, I moved to New York and became a studio musician and toured with Robert Palmer and played with Chuck Berry and Bo Diddley. And then came off the road one time and realized I was done with the Holiday Inn uh, dressing room circuit and wondered how I could sleep in my own bed at night. So I asked my musician friends in New York, they said, Jingles, man, you got to break into the session scene. So I set about um, putting a reel together and reaching for anyone and everyone I knew in that business or even a, in adjacent businesses and broke into the scene first as a bass player. I'm an electric bass player. Um, and then as a, an arranger and then a composer and then a producer. So I ended up having my first real job at age 40, working at a jingle house, running a synclavier, which is a digital musical instrument that was sort of the state of the art at the time, writing music for television. And I wrote literally dozens and dozens of commercials for radio and TV. Um, and then I saw this wacky thing in the early 90s, this technology called the World Wide Web started to appear. And um, so I became intrigued by it. I thought, well, this will... To be honest, I thought they'll probably need music. So maybe I can compose. I mean, I can't imagine that this web thing would be mute. As it turns out, 25 years later, it is mute and has been, except for like maybe Nickelodeon Cartoon Network. For all you dads, yeah, uh, that's where they use audio for cues and uh, you know navigation guidance or whatever. Um, so anyway, I taught myself to be a web producer. Took classes. Uh, went to New York Mac user group meetings in the city. Um, read a lot of books, stayed up late surfing the web, looking at code, hung out a shingle as a web producer, and um, got hired at a seminal interactive agency in New York City, uh, CKS Partners, as a freelance web producer. And worked there, and then at another company called Eagle River Interactive. And then, much to my surprise, based on meeting a woman on the train commuting into New York, I got an interview with and was hired by, drum roll, brrr, <laughs> IBM. Wow. And I'm like, yeah, it was a it was a dramatic change. So at 48, I went to work at a global 50 technology company as an account manager in their corporate internet programs, and did a lot of different things um, while I was at IBM. Because uh, as you can imagine, a company that big, lots of opportunity to do different things. Sure. Um, and I just e-tired using big blue parlance about seven years ago, and I've been working ever since as kind of a freelance writer. Um, speaker i give workshops at universities called how to succeed at jobs that don't exist yet 
And that's what we're going to talk about today, right? For all you yeah. career dads getting ready for multiple careers. So, I mean, I was, I was just trying to keep tabs. So there's the, the, the German literature and then uh, the, the, the rock and roll touring musician and then the session musicianist and then the, the web producer, the agency well, side, IBM. And then now, <laughs> yeah, it's like that is, yeah, like you say, there are people who are still working in each of those fields and we'll yes do for, i mean how do you what what do you think and i want to delve into a little bit of each of those but what what do you think has been the toughest jump from one career into into the other well i would say probably uh, making the leap and this is my wife would corroborate this right honey um <laughs> that going from the jingle biz um which was quite a lucrative uh, profession because you get yeah. paid residuals. So every time a commercial that you wrote the music for runs, mm. um, you get paid. Certainly, if you if you sing on it. So every time it's on TV or radio, the you know the, the agency writes a check and it appears in your mailbox. Mm. Um, if you play on a jingle date, you get residuals every thirteen weeks. Uh, it's like two thirds or three quarters of the session fee. So anyway. Um, that was a good business. And when I decided to go into the web biz, again, I thought, you know, at the risk of sounding immodest, I was somewhat prescient in that I think I was, I was thinking this is going to have sort of global cultural and, you know, business impact. Um, so it might be a cool thing to explore. Mm. And again, my naivete was that they might need music, which they didn't. But they, what they did need is people knew, who knew how to run teams mm. and manage to a delivery date and um, deal with a budget and a client. Yeah. So those skills I was able to transfer from the jingle biz to the web biz. But it was that was probably a lean, the leanest stretch in between. Yeah, because uh, I'm, I'm, I'm in a way I'm glad you said that because in my head that was the hardest jump because they were just so vastly different. Um, but yeah, but I, I love, I love how you're even picking out the transferable skills from music and jingles into computing and and yeah, I, th I think that's that's. It's yeah. very interesting and in what we'll come on to. And before before we leave the the jingles to, to, to one side, what what is uh, so two questions. What is your most famous jingle that you've done? And then what's also your favorite? Okay. So probably the most famous one I actually didn't write, but I played bass and sang on it, and it was the first jingle for Kit Kat. It goes like this, give me a break. Give me a break, break me off a piece of that Kit Kat bar. <laughs> I love so, it. So That's that crazy. ran for years. And uh, actually, was the funny story is we cut the date, we cut the track, and then got ready to pack up and leave. So the way the process works, right, is the the band plays and then the singers come in and sing. Yeah. So we cut the track and we're getting ready to leave and the producer comes in who's a friend of mine that's why he hired me to play on it the writer and producer he said the agency wants to hear what you guys sound like singing at you the band because they want it to be kind of rough and ready and street kind of vibe so we're like sure well because we knew what the outcome might be <laughs> yeah. like sure we're happy to you know we're we can sing um so we did it and then we left and the jingle singers came in who are needless to say terrifying i mean they sound amazing and they sight read incredibly and they work all the time. So they, they, you know, we didn't think much of it. And the next day, some of us had a, a date somewhere else at a studio in New York, cut the track, getting ready to leave. And some of the jingle singers from the Kit Kat date came in and said, you guys went on the contract. You're going to make a ton of money. They used your track and not ours. Wow. We're pissed. They were like, <laughs> really? That man as what they should be. But yeah. anyway, so, so that's one. And then I, I wrote, um, I wrote some jingles that never really, you know, were like huge, but I wrote one for Office Max. That was kind of cool, like a rock and roll pop song. Yeah. Office Max, yeah, we're taking it to the max. It was like a, like a Staples kind of a story, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was a cool one. That's really cool. I, I just, I love, and and how 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 long were you doing this for? Because you said you were, you were 40, is that right? Before you started going into the web stuff. Yeah, 40s when I had my first job where I had to be somewhere like at <laughs> nine o'clock and I had a key to open a door. Yeah. Was, like, <laughs> was, was that not really hard? Because was, was there anything that was pressuring you to get out of the jingles? 
Well, I mean, to be honest, I when I first started doing dates like sessions as a player, right? It was fun, and I mean, it's high pressure. You got it's got to sound like a record by the third time you have right. read through it. You got to play with a click track. It's got to be in tune. I've uh, got to play a lot of different styles. I mean, I did sessions with some really heavyweight players, Steve Gadd and Dave Weckl. I mean, sort of legendary players that do those dates. I mean, used to. Um, but the thing is, I quickly realized that the people on the other side of the glass, you know how studios work, right? There's a control room and then there's a studio. So the people on the other side of the glass, the writers and producers, were the ones in charge and by intimation, you know, making more money, making a good living and not having to hustle as hard. I mean, it's yeah. a different hustle, but um, so that's why I sort of uh, tried to move up the value chain. And then as a meta lesson, too, I would say to all you career dads, I mean, that's a general takeaway from my multiple careers. Try to move up the value chain. It's a model that applies in the music business, but it applies in, in every business, really. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, acquire skills, get into a management role or a role where you're leading a team or where you're interacting with a client and an internal team or, you know, take your learnings and apply them to deliver more value. And then again, the implication is you'll be more valuable uh, in the work marketplace or employee marketplace, if you will, yeah. and your odds of making, making more money and being more successful. And in theory, being more fulfilled are, yeah. are better. Yeah, I think that's really, really good advice. It's something that I've definitely tried to do in my career to date. is, uh, And it's so far, I think, served me quite well. So really, really, really good advice. Um, yeah. And so, because you've got, have you got two children? So, uh, I just have one. You have one. Okay. Uh, we started late in in all candor. We sort of had our retirement first. Um <laughs> We lived, we lived in Manhattan for 16 years. Yeah. And I loved it. We lived in a loft in Soho and then had a loft down near the seaport. Yeah. And my long-suffering wife, for the record, career dads, has been with me through the whole thing. We celebrated our 46th anniversary on Monday. Wow. Of me meeting her at the Rongovian Embassy, which was a bar in Trumansburg, New York, where I was living. That's where McKendry Spring, the band I was playing with, that's where our home base was. So. Wow. Anyway. She's been very patient. <laughs> As, right. So, I mean, that's first, that's amazing first. Um, and, and so you, you so when, uh, how, how old were you then when you had your, your child? So we had a child, uh, I think I, I turned 42. Okay. A couple, couple weeks after he was born. So he's 28. Right. Um, and again, a career dad aside, but um, I was like a hotshot musician, jingle composer in New York. And yeah. Actually, my wife worked at the Museum of Holography and was selling real estate, in fact, at the time. Okay. Sort of the a real estate boom in the late 80s in New York. But we had a baby, and she was like, uh, I'm not doing this in New York. Yeah. Um, we're out of here. So, you know, it's a typical pattern. Uh, career dads, I'm sure you've seen this movie, or you may see it at some point. But so we bought a house in Connecticut, you know, sort of within commuting distance. Yeah. And we moved from this beautiful duplex loft in lower manhattan on a saturday and monday i was commuting back into manhattan from new canaan connecticut on yeah. metro north and it was like and it's been fine i mean it was it was a long trip in and out of the city but you know our we raised our son out here in the wood burbs and uh yeah, yeah. I, I mean it always it definitely resonates, you know, I mean, there, there was a point, so I live, um, yeah, c commutable to London, 45 minutes on the train to London, and there, there was a point where, you know, your career opportunity and prospects are so much greater in London, yeah. do we want to do yeah. that commute five days a week, I don't know, do we want to live there, pre-kids maybe, once we had kids, no, um, so <laughs> I, I kind of get that, but I, I, I kind of have, or pre-COVID, had the best of both world, worlds, where it would be a couple of days in London, a couple of days um, around, there's an office close to my house here, and then a day or two from home, and that was kind of my average week, which was fantastic, but yeah. how you know, living in New York for so long and built, you know, in such a thriving community, especially within that music scene, how was it? I know you were kind of at a point in your life where you weren't necessarily leaving that, but you were transitioning into your next career. But how was it, as you say, to pack up on a, on a Friday, Saturday, and then commute back in on the Monday? How was that for you? 
Well, it was it was challenging for sure. I mean, um, but again, the, you know, the meta perspective was it was the right thing to do for our family. Yes. So again, in the context of career dad, right? So yeah. I had to sacrifice. Um, but my wife was here in, in the house with our baby. And it's a safe, we live at the end of a country lane. It's a very safe, um, very sweet town. Um, and I was able to get into New York in and out, you know, fairly easily. I mean, the Metro North trains are good. They're clean. They're fast. They're reliable. Mm. And actually, I was working in the jingle biz at the time at this jingle house. So um, it wasn't like I was going in and doing gigs and yeah. kind of running around New York like I had been doing. Because, I mean, I used to play. At one point, I was in like a dozen different bands in the city. <laughs> Everything from like jazz to R&B to punk to um, country western. I mean, it was, you know, I subbed on Broadway. I was in wow. the pit for Cats for a while. I did... Yeah. Oh. Big riff. I played with an Irish band. I mean, you know, when you, when you're a musician, you do whatever pays the bills. So yeah. Yeah. that's what I did. And um, and so and so now, you say you know you've had eight careers so far, which I like. I like you're you're not you're not done. And 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 what you're doing now is you run as uh, you have a website, improvise in, improvising careers. Yeah. Um, and let's talk about that. So I guess what what Again, two questions. Um, <laughs> what uh, motivated you to start improvising careers? And, and secondly, why that name? Well, so um, the, the sort of catalyst was a request from my alma mater, Bennington College uh, in Vermont, to come back and deliver a keynote speech to kick off a series of um, senior week activities. And this is probably 10 years ago now, so close to that. Um, and as I began to reflect on what I'd done since I graduated from Bennington, um, and I'd been doing some research on career paths and the impact of global economics on jobs and business transformation, changing skill needs and that kind of stuff. I was sort of a closet economist, if you will. Um, I, it sort of came to me that with all lack of honesty, I was somewhat the poster child for the way today's learners are going to be working. Right. Um, so I put together this talk kind of describing my careers and then some sort of visionary slash aspirational slash futurist perspective on what they, these seniors, might be doing out in the real world. And it just sort of evolved from there. And I thought improvising careers, since I'm a musician, I still do gigs. I did a gig last Friday, actually, nice. with the Otis and the Hurricanes, my Louisiana R&B band. But, um, that, that you know, improvising is kind of what it takes. That's the model, right, where you have some skills but you're not quite sure how it's going to turn out exactly mm -hmm. so you take what you need what you, what you know and then by listening in this case for careers like watching what the marketplace is doing what uh, how workforce uh, trends are changing what um, you know business and economics are dictating in terms of uh, you know what people are selling what products and services companies are selling what people are buying um, and using that as guidance to improvise what your next career might be. So that's kind of the genesis of that. No, I, I, it, I, I love it partly because I think it, it takes a little of the anxiety I have away because I, you know, <laughs> I, I, I'm someone that I know, you know, I've got this ambition. I know that I want to achieve and feel like I'm on the path to doing that. But if you said to me, right, what, what is it? What is that, that end thing that you want to do? I'd go, I don't know, because I didn't know that I wanted to do this. And this is really cool. And so I'm looking forward <laughs> to kind of stumbling into the next thing that I didn't know what I wanted to do and finding that really cool. Um, so I've definitely had an improvised career so far. Um, and I think, yeah. you know, the thing that I really hang on to are the skills, both hard and soft, as in, yes, I've got those technical business marketing skills, but the more soft people, leadership development, or at least I, I, feel, I hope I have the skills. And I think, you know, merge those together and hopefully that that, that with a, you know, an inquisitive mind is is uh, going to, to set at least set me up for the, for the future. But how do you feel around people who kind of don't know what they want to do and feel that they just fall into things versus the people who say you have to have a plan you have to know what the next thing is is there is there merit for both of those well i think you have to um you have to be prepared to 
realize that you don't know what's going to happen. Okay. That um, you know you you're you're going to do interesting things, and you may or may not have some sense of what they are, and they will certainly um, require some level of skills transfer. Mm-hmm. You know, you'll take some of what you know how to do now, and apply it in a new setting. But there always is going to be delta. Some new skills that you're going to have to learn to move into whatever your next role might be, and then the one after that. So I actually recently posted um, a, a blog on LinkedIn, um, and I encourage people to check it out. It's it's one of my key aphora or mantra, if you will, and that is chase the maelstrom, find the chaos, go for the mayhem. And the uh, imp- implication is like go where they don't know what it is yet. Like be constantly, and I I say this to career dads, right? No matter where you are in your set of improvised careers, like look for what's next. And at the risk of sounding, um, you know, maudlin or whatever, we were in the midst of a crisis for sure, the pandemic and the economic meltdown. But I was just on a CNBC small business playbook session this morning and people like Gary Vaynerchuk, and if your listeners know who he is, he's a sort of social media guru. Very, very familiar (laughs) with Gary V. Yeah. So right, Vayner, me, Gary V. So he was on, and he and uh, as well as the other speakers were saying, especially to small business, look at this as an opportunity. I mean, education is going to be transformed. Um, you know, business interaction. I mean, we're doing you know, Zoom calls and and uh, you know, new ways to sort of share webinars on and on with the endless webinars. Um, you know, lots of ways that this kind of crisis, telehealth. I mean, I was just on a call with my doctor yesterday. Um, that's a transformational opportunity. View these as opportunities. So, mm. again, back to the chase to maelstrom. Like, how are people rethinking how existing or historically um, effective processes are being upended or transformed? Yeah. And they represent opportunities. I mean, they do. So, yeah, I want to career dads to look for what's the next thing. And even in your, you know, in whatever space you career dad writ large find yourself in how is your business being transformed by this crisis i mean uh, and what can you do to help drive the business model by coming up with innovative solutions to this these crazy times and they are crazy man Uh, absolutely and i think i've i've really enjoyed seeing some of the real winners in in business of who who are just pivoting and doing things differently i know there was one video i saw of a company that had they were kind of like a little pop-up uh faux bun company and they were like oh what are we gonna do and and there and i think this actually might have been a gary v video uh and and, you know his his thing was uh, yeah it was tea with gary v one and it was it was well actually can you can you teach people to make this stuff at home and and go to making you know making the kits that get sent out in the post and you go from being this little cool you know, pop up food van to a national brand. And it was like, yeah, you know, you can really rethink some of those business opportunities that in a way have always been there. We just uh-huh. never looked at them because we haven't had to. Um, yeah. And, and and one question that, that I had for you on this, and this is, uh, this is I'm, I'm channeling my, my father-in-law now because he's a huge uh, music enthusiast, spends a lot of time <laughs> Uh, going to gigs um, and and we we were having a conversation about this Ooh. you know how can um, how can you replicate things virtually and, and and you know his the big thing that we got stuck on he was like you ca- for, for him going to an event being immersed in those people you know I can talk about VR and stuff it's not the same so what 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 do you think in terms of as a musician the whole kind of gig experience in a post-covid world well, so I think it's going to it's going to change for sure. Mm. Um, it's going to be a hybrid model. Um, I actually went to uh, it's a video, right? But I attended via video the concert that I, this EDM DJ did in Fortnite. Are you familiar yeah. with that? Yes. And it yeah, was it was really really interesting. Like you know, he's like, "Let's dance." Okay, people, you know, it's all the, people's avatars, whatever. And he goes, "Okay, let's fly." And all the avatars like <laughs> fly over the stage and in and around the venue. It was like, yeah. so I mean, that's an extreme example. I don't think um, it. You know, that kind of event will replace real events. And I think mm. with any luck, I'm certainly hoping, fingers crossed. Um, that we'll get back to live in person 
Because yeah. there's nothing like that. I mean, um, I hadn't done a gig since late February. We just started playing as a trio outside next to this restaurant in Ridgefield, Connecticut, the next town north of me. Um, and just people love to hear live music and people yeah. love to play live music. So, but I think we're, again, we're rethinking, we do it kind of in a different configuration. Um, I often use the music analogy in that, like when the cats in New York on 51st Street started playing bebop, people didn't suddenly stop playing Dixieland. Mm. It's just sort of an adjunct, an additional way to express and interact and create and, uh, and, you know, be together. Yeah. Um, so I think I think we'll see more stuff in virtuals. I mean, the VR thing can be very cool. I mean, a good headset with a well-written program can be really an amazing uh, experience, right? Really feel quite immersive. I mean, not the same as being in the same space with other carbon-based life forms. I like to say. <laughs> yeah. but, uh, but I yeah. think I think it's come back because people love to get together and play and listen to music. Absolutely. I, I, I'm just imagining in, you know, five years time where this is where we enter into a virtual room and we sit down virtually opposite one another. And it feels probably not too dissimilar to actually be yes. sat in front of one another. I think that would be quite cool. Absolutely. I along along that thread, I was in a webinar with Gerd Lienhardt, who's a futurist who lives in Zurich. But he was saying, I mean, he's speculating, right? But the airlines getting crushed by this, you know, lack of travel. He said they maybe at some point in the future you'll you'll go to an airport, and you'll get into a pod and be transported virtually to a space on the other side of the planet, and uh, maybe go to the beach or maybe go to a restaurant or, um, you know, have some virtual interaction. Because he's saying the airlines have the money and to some degree the technology to, to develop a solution like that. Yeah. I mean, it's pretty far fetched, but you know, maybe that'll be an alternative to vacation travel. Maybe, know. maybe a yeah, maybe a, a a kind of yeah PG version of Ready Player One, something like that would be quite nice. Yeah, where well, you could yeah. go somewhere and not you know you just go to the airport and get into their device and yeah. travel and go to the beach and because they'll be able to um, recreate sort of all kinds of sensory stimulation yes. to make it feel really quite real, you know. Yeah, there's a, there's a, there's a dystopian novel in there somewhere of you know that, that <laughs> happens and then uh, is it real is it not <laughs> I think that's right that, that could be the yeah that, that might write that on the whiteboard. Uh, there you go. Yes, yeah. <laughs> Truman the Truman story or whatever yeah. that. Yeah, exactly. Right? Yeah, exactly. In, in VR, it could be that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so bringing us back on 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 track slightly. So we um, uh, we were talking and you know I kind of brought up at the start of this that that your big thing is is around you know jobs that don't exist and again looking at your website you're talking around you know lunar tour guides and you know <laughs> you think things that you kind of think wow that is so far-fetched but actually is it and so whether whether it you know it is near reality or whether it's just thought provoking i think how do we as career dads but also for as career dads for our kids, how do we prepare them for jobs that don't exist? It's not like, oh, you want to be an accountant, right? Here's the things you can do to be an accountant. It's kind of, you want to be, well, I, I don't know. I don't know what that is. Where do you start? Yeah. Well, so three things that I like to cite when I do my uh, workshops, um, and, th and this is a good way to sort of start us off, I think. I say that, and research indicates and there are varying takes on this but the general research is um, indicates that 85 percent of the jobs that today's learners are going to be doing say in the next decade haven't been invented yet right so that's one two is they're going to use technology that doesn't exist today that's going to make you know carrying around an iphone look primitive i always say you know they get ready for out of the mouths of babes a, a comment from your grandchild saying Grandpa, you had to carry around a device in your hand to like talk to grandma? That's pretty lame. <laughs> wow, that must have been a pain in the neck. And then the third thing is they're going to be using this technology to solve problems that we don't yet know are problems. Um, so that's kind of, you know, context for this. The, yeah. the follow-on thought is that these emerging jobs and careers, right, are taking, taking place at the intersection of historically disconnected disciplines. So what do I mean by that? So one of the examples I cite is nanopharmacy. Okay. 
Okay. So there are companies developing um, devices that are implantable or ingestible or insertable or whatever um, that will do things like measure, uh, you know, physiological um, data um, that will deliver pharmacology at the molecular or even atomic level, right? So it'll go right to the cancer tumor or right to the wound and deliver exactly what's needed at the appropriate time in the in the right place. And there are already companies that are doing this, right? So, and again, the connection is, um, you, you know, nanomechanics uh, um, is a big focus. The three chemists who won the Nobel Prize a couple of years ago won it for nanomachines, building machines at the nano scale, right? And so you're going to have to combine that with people developing new approaches to pharmacology. And we're seeing an incredible focus on development of vaccines, right, and cures for COVID. So that kind of accelerated science process is only going to make the arrival of these kinds of nanopharmaceutical ingestible implantable devices, you know, happen sooner than later. So that's one example. I mean, there are other things like combining. Uh, one of my favorites is um, when I talk to kids, they say, anybody into astrophysics and hospitality? Usually nobody raises their hand. <laughs> yeah. But the but the idea is that there's a company called Orion Spar, and they're proposing to put up a version of the International Space Station that is a hotel. And it'll be like a four day, four days of circling the Earth at 17,000 miles an hour with, I think, four guests and two crew. So I say to these kids, well, so one of the things you're going to have to learn is how do you mix and serve a martini in microgravity? Yeah. That's going to be some Someone's new skill. Someone's going to so, have to do that job, right? Someone, someone is. That's that's a new job, right? Yeah. And they're talking about going to the moon, right, to set up some kind of um, colony and or mining, um, you know, instantiation. So the next logical extrapolation is tourism, right? So someone who understands and is fascinated by lunar geology but also has people skills, knows how to get the kid with the runny nose to um, stop crying or whatever and – yeah. So again, c combining skills that some of which exist and some don't. So how? So, okay. So so things like the um, the lunar tour guide. So that that just doesn't <laughs> exist now, right? But but right. it but it easily could. But it also might not. So how? Or, or, yeah. or I guess or I guess it is is. My question would be, you know, if someone was listening to this and be like, I want to be a lunar tour guide and they do they do their research they do, and it kind of never happens because it doesn't <laughs> exist. Um, you know, what how much should people be focused on doing a job that does exist today versus having an eye on a job that doesn't I either because there's a difference between something that's new and emerging like voice marketing versus right. something that just isn't even on the peripherals of our vision because we can't even comprehend it yet. So where yeah. do you think people should spend their time between we understand it now, we can see it coming in, and pff, got no idea? <laughs> well, so I think they're probably, I mean, everyone has a different level of comfort with risk, um, a different proclivity around um, what they think is viable, um, so I think it's, you know, there isn't sort of a blanket answer to that okay. question, but I would say, um, as a general rule, my admonition, again, to colleagues, especially new hires at IBM was always, once you're comfortable in your job, like after 18 months, start looking for your next job. Yeah. And again, the idea that the U S Bureau of Labor Statistics says, um, today's learners are going to have eight to 10 jobs by the time they're 38. Yeah. I mean, that's a public sector data point. I mean, they have no vested interest in the outcome or, yes. They're not trying to sell anything with that data. Yeah. So now that's an average, right? I mean, you know, that's the mean. That there's going to yeah. be more and less depending on, uh, again, your personality, your level of interest, your ambition, whatever. Yeah. Um, I would say at the very minimum, people, uh, career dads in whatever job you're in now, be thinking about what's coming next. Again, yes. chase the maelstrom. Like be aware that it's going to change, you know, um, innovative, successful companies – are always looking for people who can help them drive the transformation of their portfolio of products and services, yeah. right? And it's going to it's going to change faster and faster. And they're looking for people who are ready 
to contribute and and help them drive the business model and make innovative changes to the uh, to to deal with the addressable opportunity in the market, right? Yeah. Come up with the next iPhone or the next sure. um, VR headset or the next COVID vaccine or whatever it might be, right? Yeah. Um, I would say for the ones who are maybe more ambitious, if you skew more toward creative or less risk averse um, and have an interest in taking on non-trivial challenges, I would say think about you know who's the company that's going to be um, setting up the lunar tour guide training yeah and maybe maybe you start a company and maybe incrementally so the an incremental step might be um, orienting people who work for SpaceX or for Virgin Galactic right because space tourism is about to take a major leap forward mm-hmm. um, now that the crew dragon has proven we can you know the private sector can send astronauts to and from the space station, and that next logical, you know, extrapolation of that is space tourism. And so maybe you're not a lunar tour guide, but maybe you're a SpaceX tour guide for low Earth orbit um, excursions. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And that's that kind of, that's almost the safer path to then go into the the space you know, tourism further down the line when that becomes more established potentially. Yeah, and maybe your child or your grandchild will be the lunar tour guide yeah. at some point. My <laughs> grandpa used to. Uh, <laughs> Sit in the SpaceX and uh, tell tourists about what the Earth looked like. Back when we could only go into suborbital, back back in 2025. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And I, I really like the point around the, the, the eight jobs by, by 38. I think I'm, I'm 33 and I'm on my sixth, like post-university job. I think it's my sixth, maybe my seventh. I was trying to do the arithmetic in, in, in my head. Um, yeah. but, you know, I and you know, I've I've been in the the role that I'm doing now uh, for three years, and it's definitely come to that point where you know this. I know this is going out to the world, but I've always ha- I've had this conversation with my manager, so we're all good. Uh, you know, it's come <laughs> to that point where we're we're saying, you know, it's time for something new. Uh, so I definitely understand. Uh, I think that's really great advice. I think the eighteen months. Yeah. Mark, when you get to the point where you can do it and and do it well, and yeah, it's it's time. To look for something. Yeah, do something else. And I would I would say that to career dads as as encouragement too, not like discouragement. I mean, it's you know look for what's new. You you're gonna yeah. have the, you're gonna have the chance to do really interesting a bunch of really interesting things. Yeah. Multiple careers over the course of your work life, quote unquote. So don't be don't shrink from it. Don't be afraid of it. Jump in. I mean, we're at really a seminal point in time where all kinds of factors are coming together in terms of technology and cultural access and a sense of community on a global scale that uh, you can do stuff that's going to be really, really interesting and transformational for humanity at a meta level. Again, yeah. that's my little philosophy hat on. But uh... No, I like that <laughs> because, it, because it's got purpose as well, which I think is really yeah. important. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you, you touched on IBM, um, and I, I know because I do my research, uh, you, when you worked at IBM, you were involved in virtual worlds which is a huge passion of mine. So I want to know what, <laughs> what attracted you to virtual? How did you get into virtual worlds? <laughs> well, so actually, here's how it happened. So I was having um, what we call at IBM an informational interview. Just to remind your listeners, I was at IBM for 15 years, a uh, long time, wow. um, decade and a half. I mean, I did a lot of different things, but it was uh, it was an amazing experience, needless to say. Um But I went to speak with this gentleman, Irving Vladowski Berger. I don't know if your listeners know who he is, but he was uh, one of the first sort of internet big thinkers at IBM. And he now, he's a sort of adjunct professor at MIT and at Yale. And he writes a blog for CIO and for the Wall Street Journal. Really smart, interesting guy. But he was on his way out. He was about to uh, retire. Um, And he said, you should check out what this guy, Ian Hughes, is doing um, at the IBM Research Lab in London, they're exploring virtual worlds, and I think you would find it interesting because you seem like a creative guy who's uh, interested in new technology. So anyway, I hooked up with this group, and as I mentioned before, there were like 5,000 members of what we call the Virtual Universe Community, and um, this is like 2007. And this then CEO, Sam Pomizano, allocated $10 million to create what he called an emerging business opportunity, EBO, to explore if there was, you know, a, a business model in virtual worlds and in Second Life specifically. So we built instantiations for Deutsche Bank and for Circuit City and for a bunch of other clients and, um, you know, explored whether we could actually make money 
you know, selling services and building uh, environments for IBM customers. Um, it was fun. It was moderately successful. There were lots of different challenges around it, um, not the least of which was the level of um, service that Linden Labs, the owner of Second Life, was able to provide us. I mean, IBM is, you know, 430,000 people in 190 countries around the world, and there are like half a dozen, like, ex-hippies in, like, a loft in uh, San Francisco. I mean, I'm being facetious. They had a smart <laughs> team, but um, various for various reasons, um, they shut it down after a couple of years. Yeah. Um, but I did a lot of, we did events. As I mentioned before, I was a concierge and a greeter, at an IBM Academy of Technology event that we ran in Second Life, and the topic was virtual worlds. Mm. So there were keynote speakers and plenary sessions and um, poster sessions, and there was a recreational area with jet skis and a, you know, treehouse and uh, yeah. picnic table and virtual beers. <laughs> yeah. So it's yeah. cool. I was I was into it. I, I I love it, and I think you know, and uh, yeah, as we were talking before, I cr I kind of grew up on those type of. MMORPGs, multi, uh, massively multiplayer online games such as Ultima Online and saw that yeah. kind of, I saw for the first time as a young teenager, you know, people selling virtual stuff on eBay for real money and thinking, huh. Um, and there's a guy called uh, Julian Dibble uh, who wrote a book called uh, How I Made um, a Million Dollars in, in, you know, I can't remember the exact title, How I Made a Million Dollars in kind of virtual money or something, you know. <laughs> and he he was a, a bit kind of like a, a gamer stroke investigative journalist and you know huh. and we, as we talked about before he uncovered some of the darker side of that so where you'd have um you know they called them kind of chinese farms but you know where they'd have people just shutting containers who were just farming gold to sell and you know so there's right. definitely a darker side but um the thing yeah. that really the, the 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 thing that really hit the nail on the head for me and i thought this is potentially big was around 2009 2010 and as, as i mentioned i wrote my thesis on this so i i, I know i'm a bit of a nerd when it comes to it but i know <laughs> you know world, world of warcraft um released this and if you don't know world of warcraft i'm sure yeah. everyone does uh, you know uh, but you know they, they released this horse and it was called the ethereal horse so it was just a see-through horse and and they they were selling it for twenty dollars, and I remember um, they they put it live, and within twenty four hours they'd sold a million of these horses. Wow. And I was like, hang on a minute, they've taken <laughs> they've taken because the horse already exists, right? So all they've done is get got some sort of visual designer to reskin it to make it see through, and uh -huh. it doesn't matter if there was a million orders or a billion order, they just. <laughs> increase the units and hit send and i'm thinking they're literally printing money and yeah and so I, you know that, that just fascinated me um and so yeah i'm always yeah. you know when i it is actually i find quite rare to meet someone who is quite passionate about virtual worlds so uh, i'm really oh, glad yeah. that we have that in common well my so my follow-on story to that is um when i was working at ibm and in, in, involved in virtual worlds i had mm -hmm. In real life, IRL, I had a blue tick coonhound, which is a southern hunting dog. Long ears, long legs, real loud. So I tracked down a woman in Second Life who made animals and sent her a bunch of pictures. And she created a copy of Zoe, my blue tick coonhound, in Second Life. And, and with a bunch of props, she had like a feeding bowl and a bed. And she had, I think, half a dozen poses she would sit, lie down, she would bawl, she would bark, she would follow me, like I could, you know, set a setting so she would walk alongside me, heal yeah. when I was, my avatar was walking around second. <laughs> and I paid, I probably paid her like 50 bucks or something, yeah, but it yeah. was cool. Yeah. And the dog lived in my office, I had an air, air pod or whatever above one of IBM's island. Yeah. I had an office, yeah, anyway. <laughs> no, I, lo I, I love that. There was when I was at university, one of my friends, instead of getting, quote, a real job, um, he used to play this game uh, EverQuest and he um, he leveled up people's characters for cash. Um, that was yeah. his. And he was like, people are paying me to play, you know, like three hundred dollars, <laughs> like to, you know, yeah. to end level their characters. And he's like, this will take me a week. So he's making <laughs> good money. And yeah, so really? I, I, I love that. And I think, you know, to bring that into 
today so i'm i'm speaking at an event in a couple of months that was meant to be physical in london um but it's not and and it's all virtual and i thought oh a virtual event for the day that could be i've seen a demo of this thing and i don't know if you're ever familiar with habbo hotel or or anything back in the yes, day uh -huh. yeah so yeah, if you imagine yeah. habbo hotel and, and for, for you, the listeners kind of if you think of the sims but a bit of a hotel scenario you can walk around you have a room you can build it so this 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 conference, this virtual conference is that you have your avatar, I guess, a bit like Second Life and you can walk, you can meet, you can talk, you can links off to the web for people's bios. But then when you go into the lecture theatres and you all sit down as your avatars, it slowly yeah. zooms into the screen and then boom, here we are giving a live talk, live Q&A. The, the talk ends, it zooms back out and we go back to our avatars and go for a networking coffee. Yeah. I'm really excited cool. by this. Yeah. Well, so I recently was in a, in a virtual space called Verbella. Do you know that space? No. Well, there it's it's run by, a, I think it's run by like a real estate company in California. Hmm. But it, it's sort of like Second Life, but toned down. I mean, you can't fly. You can't really, okay. you can sort of sort of teleport. Um, but it's, it's pretty simple. It's hmm. not a huge client. Um, and they've been running events in there. I sort of went in there and explored, because I'm going to be a, uh, an MC for a virtual conference on quantum technologies in October. And we're talking about maybe doing one activity in this virtual space. Wow. You know, and they have like conference rooms and they have small meeting rooms. And like Second Life, you can configure it with a click of a mouse, you know, make it classroom or round tables or, you know, whatever. Yeah. Or chair, comfortable chairs. Yeah. yeah, Verbella, it was pretty cool. Oh, cool. I'll check that yeah. out. That's, yeah, yeah. Uh, that sounds really, really cool. So um, that's virtual. We have to leave virtual worlds there. Otherwise, we'll have to yeah. have a whole second podcast <laughs> of virtual really? worlds. Um, but the, um, the kind of last question that I wanted to ask you was, uh, I, I, I kind of didn't want to tee this up in this way, but I've started now. I, I hate the where do you see yourself in five years because my honest answer is i i don't know we're not in an age where it's ah, it's in your chair well no actually i, I don't know um so what, <laughs> so again right. to, to finish it with the theme of two questions um yeah one what do you say to someone who gets asked that oh you know what is a good response for someone who gets asked where do you see yourself in five years what's a good way of responding to that and and then secondly where do you see yourself in five years <laughs> Well, so, okay, so the first question, I think if people ask you that question, career mm -hmm. dad listeners, um, I would say keep it bordering on metaphysical and or philosophical, right? So an answer might be, I'll be doing something really, really interesting, and I have no idea what it is. Yeah, It's going to be using a technology that um, either doesn't exist or is just emerging today. Um, probably going to be working with people I've never met. Um, probably working with people who are geographically distributed. That's the new model for sure. Um, and hopefully we'll be doing something that's not only interesting, but has impact both from a business perspective, obviously, because you got to make money to fund a business, but also implications around sort of global cultural and societal impact. Um, Cause it's, you know, that's, it's easier to do. And my generation thinking of career dads listening who are younger than me, um, I think there's more and more focus on that, and I think that's a good thing. Yeah. Right. So that's that's a general direction. And then for me, I don't know. I mean, I'm I've been working on a book for a while. I'm hoping to have it finished and published within the year, maybe. I'm sort of outlining what I I call it uh, my future career toolkit. Again, I could put a plug in for my Absolutely. course on LinkedIn Learning. Right. It's the course is called Future Proofing Your Data Science Career, but the core of it is what I call the future career toolkit. It's something I developed um, over, you know, after codifying how I navigated these multiple careers. And there are three elements, voice, antenna, and mesh. The voice exercise uh, lets you sort of identify your brand, if you will, your product description using uh, triggers like uh, semantic intuition kinds of tools. You know, you pick a book, a movie, a TV show, a game, and what characteristic resonates with you. The antenna piece is looking out for sources, where are conversations going on? What are the channels where people or companies or organizations are talking about the topic you're interested in? And then the mesh piece is kind of a three-dimensional data visualization exercise 
your network of networks, like tracking down the actual people and or companies or organizations who are doing interesting stuff that you might want to do in your next job or the job after that and reaching for them. I mean, LinkedIn is the key yeah. tool, right? That's the lingua franca these days. Um, and that's sort of the process. So I encourage career dads to take a look. Even if you're not into data science necessarily, you could just go to this course and check out the, the central construct around the future career toolkit. But in terms of me, I'd love to be doing more talking and presenting. I mean, I love uh, running workshops and helping provide guidance. I mean, it's the adage to, you know, learn, earn, return. So I'm definitely in the return phase here. Um, sharing, you know, somewhat altruistically for sure, what I've learned, what I've been through as a way to help uh, today's learners, regardless of age, um, be successful and feel fulfilled in a series of careers. Yeah, I love that. And yeah, and, and it's a really great plug, plug both for the, the book um, and when you, you obviously have to let me know when that's out because I want a copy, but also I can, you know, let, let the listeners know. And, and as well, you know, LinkedIn Learning. So you're an educator on LinkedIn Learning, which is super cool in itself. Yeah, yeah. no, it's great. And again, to give you a sense of multiple careers, so I, in fact, had a conversation with my content manager at LinkedIn Learning and they've asked me to develop a course on quantum careers, how to jumpstart your quantum career based on my MC role, and then also future fintech. So wow. uh, wide-ranging topics. But again, stuff I'm interested in and yeah. um, knowledgeable enough about to put together a course. Yeah, that's great. Well, yeah, yeah, I'm personally very excited to see to see more of that come out. And um, again, Chris, just to... Thank you so, so much for your time. It's been an absolute pleasure speaking with you. Well, thank you, Dan. And good luck to all you career dads. Remember, you're going to do really cool, interesting stuff, lots of interesting roles, lots of different jobs. Um, and being a dad is the best part of it, right? That's, <laughs> that's, that's, that's the real job. That's the most important job. <laughs> Absolutely. That's the career that endures throughout. <laughs> exactly. For sure. Awesome.